So hello to everyone. I'm Fabio Tacone from Brussels. And I have a pleasure to have here today for the ISM chat, Gavin Perkins from UK. Hello, Gavin. Hi, good to see you. So Gavin Perkins, Professor of Critical Care Medicine, University of Warwick. Um, he has been involved as PI in different randomized clinical trials and is a worldwide recognized expert in uh, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation in general in cardiac arrest field and co-chair of the ILCOR guidelines and chair of the ERC guidelines. So I think he's the perfect person today to discuss with us about some issues on cardiac arrest. So Gavin, I know you cannot disclose the ERC guidelines that will be available soon during the ERC Congress, but they have some questions, a very practical questions for you. And the first one would be the quality of CPR. So we know it's very important in the cardiac arrest field. We have some tools to monitor, appreciate this quality of CPR, which are the ones that you would recommend and how we're ready to titrate the CPR based on these tools. So, so that's a great question, you know, and, and quite you know, relevant with the upcoming uh, European Resuscitation Council guidelines that, as you say, will come out next Thursday and Friday. Uh, closely linked to the um, European Resuscitation Council conference on that topic. So quality of CPR is one of those incredibly important things. High quality CPR is definitely uh, one of the key contributors to the best outcomes from cardiac arrest. We know that uh, CPR is often done poorly. Compressions are often too shallow. There are often long interruptions. Uh, and all of those interrupt cardio and cerebral blood flow and, and are therefore harmful. CPR feedback and prompt devices you know, are, are useful devices in providing real-time feedback. But the most recent review from the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation actually points to them being a much more powerful tool when used at the system level rather than at the individual level. And it's much more difficult to demonstrate an effect at an individual patient level from the use of the devices than if they're used in the context of a quality improvement program with continuous uh, feedback to providers and really to drive the system forward to make sure that the you know, quality of CPR is optimized across the system. So I think they're a great innovation uh, and they're most powerful when used at a system level. Do you think that in the future we may use these devices to change, adapt our CPR? You know, people think that they are doing correctly, but maybe we can look at, you know, some parameters and increase the depth of compression, increase the frequency or whatever could be available to increase the flow during CPR? Yes. Yeah, so, so I certainly think, you know, th thinking ahead, you know, five or 10, you know, years, years maybe that with the development of artificial uh, intelligence, you know, algorithms that one could conceptualize uh, the idea that one's receiving physiological feedback based on patient parameters, end tidal CO2, maybe uh, aortic diastolic blood pressure or some markers of cerebral blood flow uh, that with rapid computer processing, uh, the type and the quality of CPR can be manipulated in order to find the sweet spot for the individual patient that's receiving treatment. Thanks a lot. One thing that is, I mean, very important for us, uh, very controversial, is the role of adrenaline. We know that we can restart uh, the heart, but uh, you, know, you have been involved, of course, in trials in this setting. I would like to have your opinion, uh, even in the light of the American Heart Association uh, guidelines, which is the place of adrenaline? Is it dependent on the patient, on the rhythm, on the setting, or is it so effective as uh, we could expect? So, so, so I think I've, I've learned a, through a few things from the focus uh, or research on adrenaline. And I, and I guess the first take home message about the use of adrenaline uh, is to highlight the importance of the chain of survival before you get to giving adrenaline. You get much better impact on patient survival from delivering high quality CPR uh, and rapid defibrillation uh, than a relatively small uh, contribution from the use of, of drugs, including uh, uh, adrenaline. Uh, I think the Paramedic 2 uh, and other studies have shown convincingly that adrenaline is highly effective at restarting the heart uh, and indeed leads to a small overall survival increase 
but in the paramedic too, that wasn't associated with a concomitant uh, improvement in favourable neurological outcome, which of course, you know, when we talk to patients and their relatives, you know, that really is the, the, the panacea, the goal that, you know, that they wish to receive. Um, I think some things that we've learned um, following publication of the Paramedic 2 study uh, is the importance of timing of adrenaline and particularly uh, in non-shockable rhythms, trying to administer adrenaline uh, as rapidly as possible because uh, the longer that someone remains in cardiac arrest, uh, the, the longer the time that the brain is deprived of oxygen uh, and the greater the likelihood that someone, whilst they may be successfully uh, resuscitated, you know, has sustained a severe brain injury from, from what they can't recover from. So um, I, I think the American Heart Association, um, having aligned with the recommendations from ILCOR of giving adrenaline early for patients with non-shockable rhythms uh, and deferring it until after initial attempts at defibrillation uh, has put adrenaline in the, the, the right place. Um, you know, but again, to emphasize, um, you know, focus on improving the proximal parts of the chain of survival will have a much bigger impact uh, than the use of uh, drugs later in the care pathway. Do you think that uh, the fact that we recommend early adrenaline and also preferred intravenous line can have some potential effect on the quality of CPR? Because you have to, of course, have the line, which is not as easy as, uh, you know, the intraosseous one. It could it potentially be an issue. So, so again, you know, a, a, a great question. And, and I think, you know, that, that there is uncertainty about the, the, the most effective route for gaining vascular access in, in cardiac arrest. In fact, in, in the UK, we're hoping shortly to uh, launch a trial to answer that very research question. Uh, intraosseous access has the advantage, as you say, that it is much more rapidly, it's always much easier uh, and rapid to gain uh, vascular access. Uh, I guess if we think to the, the, the Paramedic 2 uh, study, um, the, the findings of that study reflect the real world experience of needing to obtain you know, vascular um, access. Uh, I think there's some data from the States that suggests the more people that are at a cardiac arrest, uh, the better the outcomes. And I guess it's about orchestrating that totality of, of, of care that allows you to continue high quality CPR and defibrillation uninterrupted because you've got enough people uh, to uh, obtain vascular access and administer drugs. The following question is related to this because one other intervention that potentially can uh, disturb people from the quality of CPR is the, of course, the endotracheal intubation. We have, I mean, we had quite a few publication in this uh, topic recently. Can we you just summarize us, which is the actual approach to the intubation during CPR? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I, I think the key to the use of uh, intubation, again, probably comes back to a system and, and a practitioner type of level. I don't think that whether you use a supraglottic airway uh, or the tracheal tube makes a big difference to, to, to patient outcome. What I do think makes a big difference is that if you're not highly skilled and competent at the use of a tracheal tube, uh, you risk esophageal intubation, which obviously has uh, disastrous consequences. Uh, and equally, interrupting CPR for multiple intubation attempts is also going to be harmful. So there's probably not much in it. A supraglottic airway uh, is, is certainly simpler uh, and easier. And if you're not regularly practicing and successful in your intubation attempts, uh, that then focusing on the use of supraglottic airways uh, is likely to serve your patient better uh, than having multiple attempts and, and then failing to secure the airway with intubation. There is, uh, of course, another question which is very practical. Um, do we need to do as much as we can on site? So should we transport the patient to the hospital during CPR? And if yes, which patients? So, so again, I think, you know, the, uh, a, a great question and quite topical given Jim Christensen's you know, paper published recently in, in JAMA looking at the resuscitation outcome consortium experience of transporting patients versus continu continuing resuscitation uh, at the scene. And I think that that study uh, showed a, a clear signal uh, that there are benefits from continuing resuscitation at the scene until you achieve a return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, this comes back to the great debate of do you stay and play or do you, you know, load and go? Uh, and I guess when I've looked at the, the, the literature and also when I've undertaken our own 
uh, evaluations in the UK health system. I think one of the key questions is, what is the purpose of transporting the person to hospital? The majority of people who are transported into hospital with ongoing CPR, there's no special additional interventions that are provided in the hospital. Uh, and as the journey is likely to involve interruptions in the quality of CPR, uh, I think you really need to ask yourself you know, a very clear question. What is the benefit of me bringing in the, the, the patient to hospital? And certainly in most healthcare systems at the moment, there's relatively little that the hospital can add for the majority of cardiac arrest patients over and above what a paramedic uh, or physician can deliver at the scene of the cardiac arrest. Do you think that uh, in the light of the transport, you said there is very little we can do, maybe eCPR could be an issue? And if yes, uh, for which patients? So, so I, I, I was specific in, in, in saying in, in most healthcare uh, systems that there's little to be uh, gained or additional interventions in the hospital setting, because at the current time, I think that is the reality. ECPR programmes are generally in their infancy. Um, and although there, there are a few uh, hotspots of, of excellence where they've had programmes for a number of years, it's not a treatment that's accessible to the majority of patients that sustain a cardiac arrest. I think the research to date has certainly shown that uh, initiating patients onto eCPR um, is feasible. Um, that the recent real world uh, experience from um, D D Dimitris and the Minnesota experience showed 100% uh, successful cannulation rate. But we need to consider it in the I guess, the setting of a whole system. And, and I think uh, where studies have shown the best survival, it's been in cases where the arrest has perhaps been witnessed, where the initial rhythm is uh, shockable or there's a high suspicion of a cardiac cause, so potentially some reversibility. Uh, and the eCPR can be started within a 30-minute period. And I think that narrows it down um, fairly substantially to the uh, half a million people that sustain an out of hospital cardiac arrest each year uh, around the world. So I think it, it's a really interesting uh, technology, but, but I think at this point it remains out of reach for the majority of people that are going to sustain a, a cardiac arrest. Uh, Gavin, I really have to thank you for this fascinating conversation we had on the science related to resuscitation and cardiac arrest. There will be much more, of course, as you mentioned, with the upcoming guidelines. And uh, these, there are many things will be discussed during the ERC Congress. So thanks, thanks for being with us and I'll see you soon. Thanks, it's been my pleasure.